Good afternoon, and thank you for joining the Universal Peace Federation's International Media Association for Peace's monthly webinar on the peaceful reunification of Korea. My name is Hans Moyer, and I currently serve as the North American Coordinator for IMAP, along with my colleagues, Ray LaPalkin in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, and Pierre Beauregard in Montreal, Canada. The International Media Association for Peace recognizes the vital role that journalists play in guarding against totalitarianism and, su and supporting the expansion of freedom. IMAP represents a worldwide professional network of journalists who support a socially responsible and moral media to convey <clears throat> Sorry about that, a little tech glitch here. Okay. IMAP represents a worldwide professional network of journalists who support a socially responsible or moral media to convey accurate content, address the challenges of our times based on the highest principles of ethical journalism, while understanding that universal values are key elements of a world of peace. Today's uh, program will be entitled back-channel diplomacy approaches to Korean unification, telling the rest of the story. Track two diplomacy refers to the unofficial and informal back-channel meetings between private citizens, just like yourselves, and other non-state actors. Track two can augment official diplomatic efforts called track one, but is not a substitute the value of track two diplomacy is the freedom it offers for mitigating conflicts by exploring solutions derived from the public view in a relatively relaxed setting out of the spotlight and without the burden of bargaining for advantage in formal negotiations. So we have two wonderful speakers today who have been very active in this back channel um, type of diplomacy. Our first speaker today will be Dr. Sung Ho Lee. Dr. Sung Ho Lee is an expert in environmental management, critical thinking and governance and education, and the US federalism and international relations. Dr. Lee was senior researcher and adjunct professor at New York University Graduate School of Public Service. At NYU, he managed research related to the United Nations environmental programs and taught students and government officials from China, Russia, Eastern European on environment and information management and critical thinking in governance. He also worked for the New York State Legislative Commission on critical transportation choices. He holds a PhD degree in political science from the State of University of New York at Albany. Dr. Lee is the president of the DMZ Forum Incorporated, a US registered 501c3 nonprofit organization founded in New York in 1997 that aims to preserve globally unique biological and cultural resources of the Korean DMZ or demilitarized zone as a sanctuary for peace and nature. He has promoted Green the Conflict Movement, Green the Conflict Movement to turn the Korean DMZ into a UNESCO World Heritage Site and designate the area linking Mount Kumgang in North Korea, the DMZ and Mount Sorak in South Korea, a UNESCO biosphere reserve. He conducted joint on-site research on such rare species as tigers, leopards, Asian black bears, red-crowned cranes and white-napped cranes in the near, near the DMZ. He also has worked on establishing a monument 
in the middle of the DMZ, honoring all the dead during the Korean War, resembling the Gettysburg National Monument in the United States, right here in Pennsylvania, where I live. Dr. Lee has helped plant thousands of tree saplings on many North Korean hills and mountains in dire conditions. He visited Seipodong Pang, Amyong Plain, Wansong Songdo Wan, and Masi Kryong Ski Resort. I hope I said that all right there. And met with high ranking North Korean officials to help them establish more tree nursery farms and Argo forestry facilities. His media interviews related to the Korean DMZ in North Korea have appeared in Science Magazine, Stars and Stripes, The Wall Street Journal, CNN, BBC, KBS, NBC, NBN, Japan Times, and many other publications. He and his wife, Stacy Lee, have three children, Rachel Lee, Ryan Lee, and Raymond. His topic today is President Joe Biden's leadership in turning the Korean DMZ into a peace zone. Dr. Lee, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. Moyer, for the detailed and kind introduction. I'm so glad that this final week of 2021 Tuesday webinar, I'm so honored uh, to join this uh, webinar sponsored by UPF, International Mediation Media Association <clears throat> East and Washington Times Foundation. Thank you, thank you for this invitation. So I'm gonna to move to my PowerPoint. So I'd like to talk about <clears throat> President Biden's new leadership in turning the Korean DMZ into a peace zone. So we need a new leadership in overcoming the US, North Korea deadlock. That has been in deadlock situation for many decades in a track one diplomacy. So in recent years, Despite the highly expected US North Korea summit during the Trump administration, their mutual demands are not still met. <clears throat> so we can think about something like this President Biden's visit to Pyongyang, which was once called Jerusalem of the East, Pyongyang. So North Korea demands stopped the hostile policies toward North Korea <clears throat> and lift economic sanctions. And the US demands discard North Korean nuclear weapons that North Korea claim to possess for purely defense measures. So key here is the nuclear weapons. The Soviet Union developed in 1949. Then, China developed after the Korean War. It's because nuclear attacks was considered by the US in November 1950, because Chinese forces invaded and cut the US forces on the Northern side. But the nuclear attacks were not executed because its effectiveness was questioned. Because Chinese forces probably brought more shovels and bugles than rifles. They made huge underground facilities. So nuclear attacks was questioned. So this war became the longest modern civil war deadlocked. So how to overcome the deadlock? I think we need to understand some historical and cultural understandings of North Koreans and South Koreans. Koreans have a strong 
self-esteem. <clears throat> because Dr. Hak Chan Moon, the co-founder of UPF, said in early December, Korea has never invaded neighboring countries in history. When Korea was called Gojoseon, Korea was a nation occupying all the territory of the current China. Koreans have been called a people of white clothes because they hate wars and respect the heaven. <clears throat> so in order to avoid such wars, they ended up living in the Korean Peninsula. So that's some reason why Koreans have such self strong self-esteem. But there are some differences between North and South Koreans. No, why are South Koreans more creative and practical? So BTS, movie, and Samsung. <clears throat> North Koreans became more independent and militaristic due to rough, natural, and geopolitical environment. So here, North Korea is composed of over 80% of mountains, very rough environment. And geopolitical reason, there's a long history of China North Korea conflicts. So strong cultural animosity between them. <clears throat> so in a long historical and cultural sense, North Korea seems to be the only country in Asia China feels threatened. Actually in history, Chinese, some Chinese kingdoms were destroyed due to their continued efforts to conquer North Korea than Korea. <clears throat> So recently, this is a Morambong band of North Korea abruptly canceled its performance in Beijing in 2015 because Chinese government did not show proper courtesy. So they just returned from Beijing. This is the most North Korean independent fighters during the Japanese Korean era, very militaristic, and nuclear weapons. <clears throat> Many US specialists misunderstand that China can control North Korea in one way or another to stop North Korean nuclear programs. Actually, they tried at least twice, but failed. First, in 1994, when Kim Il-sung died, China stopped all the assistance. That is arduous march, Gunana Hengwon, until 1998. Several millions of North Koreans death out of famine. So no, no, China actually put a lot of pressure. Next round is 2011 when Kim Jong-un died. Chinese government trying to set up a popular regime by the King John Nam and Jiang Songte, <clears throat> but failed. So North Korea nuclear weapons more actually threat to China. So China has tried a wide ranging history manipulation of East Asia recently. So I think by the East Asia should think about ways to keep China and North Korea Apart. <clears throat> this is Dr. Jenkins joined recently introducing Pastor Paula White in Seoul. She said, long before the trail, I deeply studied your history, Korean history. I've been impacted by your culture and have known of the invasion by many countries over 900 times and how you always overcame the oppression and suffering that was endured in the suffering you never invaded another nation to expand its own territory. This land has a depth of heart profound due to this history of suffering. 
<clears throat> Just as the God judges the people, deliver them from suffering. I believe God is going to deliver his people in Korea, both North and South. She said somehow U.S. allowed communism to sweep in, into the northern half of the Korean Peninsula. So America has, should have stopped communism. As Americans, we have a God-given responsibility to restore North and South Korea to be one nation and one, one people again. So as she said, there was Japanese surrender and Korea was delighted after World War II. But who are North Koreans? Most Korean people who moved to North at the end of the World War II had been extremely defiant and militaristic and joined military combat style independence movement. And they joined Chinese Communist Party. And they fought together with Chinese for Korea's independence, not knowing much about communism as it is. And later fought against Kuomintang army. These Korean soldiers literally witnessed how the entire China fell into the hands of Chinese Communist Party, 1949. At that time, they don't know much about communism. They just mistakenly perceived South Koreans under U.S. military as similar to Koreans under Japanese colonialism. The North Koreans, who happened to be North Koreans, simply viewed the United States as another imperialist force, just replaced in Japan in their continued independence movement. This is Korean War, North Korean young soldiers who fought in China, now in Korea. In 1948, U.S. withdrew its forces from South Korea. In 1950, in January, Secretary of State Dean Hutchison announced so-called Hutchison Line, excluding South Korea from the U.S. Defense, defense Line. This suddenly gave a wrong message to Stalin, who was a big brother, and he died in March in 1953 in the Rome International Commons. Stalin was 73 years old. 1950. Mao, 57. Kim Il-sung, 38. So North Korea was able to attack South in 1950 only with firm agreements and strong personal assurance from Stalin and Mao. Still, North Korea cannot make an unilateral decision to attack South Korea. And North Korea simply do not have any neighboring countries they can attack unilaterally with nuclear weapons unless they are first invaded by the other countries. So Stalin, here Stalin approved the attack and supplied lots of lots of tanks and armaments in this period. And this first Korean civil war was began with the Soviet armaments and young North Koreans who fought in China against Japan. So, only three days soil was occupied and one month, South Korea and UN forces here and General MacArthur attacks in China. 
Three months later, exactly, Seoul was retaken in September. And then moved to the north in October 1st. And moved too fast to the north. Already in October 1950, Chinese forces secretly invaded over here, cut the supply line here. At the time, nuclear attacks was considered by the U.S., but denied because Chinese forces with shovel and bugles made a long underlying underground tunnels. So its effectiveness of nuclear attacks was questioned. So there's a Hung Nam retreat here. And Chinese forces come down to retake, retook the Seoul in the spring of 1951 until UN forces here sustained and retook the Seoul in spring in 1950. And uh, in the spring of 1951, This line was formed and the war lasted two years in this region. And uh, <clears throat> actually this became TMG. And Chinese, uh, there is a peace negotiation, but China objected because most of Chinese captives want to go to Taiwan instead of mainland China. So that China rejected this kind of armistice agreement. So it took more than one year. The war is still going on. So later, China agreed, but Stalin objected because of some political reasons. So Stalin wants US forces here in the Korean Peninsula rather than in Europe. But Stalin died in March, 1953 and armistice was agreed like this. Korean DMG was established. It's only armistice. So North Korea considers TMJ as a symbol of US imperialism national disgrace and try to nullify the armistice. <clears throat> By contrast, South Korea largely Use TMJ by diversity bonanza. But the United States have a mixed feeling because US just want to maybe forget it as a forgotten war. But uh, to US, Korean War has remained as trauma, trauma in the US as a 30,914 US soldier, death was unacceptable. And the war only ended up keeping the status quo. In a huge humiliation of Hunan retreat. So US naturally has indelible animals toward North Korea. So recently UN command investigating whether civilians were military or military attire inside Korean DMG. This is the presidential candidate, Mr. Yun. So U.S. showed its muscle to tell who controlled the DMG. It's the armistice agreement. So Korea was, South Korea was not part of armistice. Although in previous years, military attire was 
sort of allowed in many cases. So at this time, President Biden should change its view on the Korean War and the Korean DMZ. As Reverend Sun Myung Moon made a historic speech in 2000 at, at the UN, the entire DMZ crosses Korean Peninsula can be turned into peace zone on the UN jurisdiction. But uh, persuading North Korea is not an easy task. North Korea will not simply give up its northern half of the DMZ as they no longer adhere to the armistice. They may do so with satisfying their economic incentives and security guarantee, but in terms of economic sanctions, North Korea has even under severe US economic sanctions for the nearly 70 years. It has been suffering and endured and survived. So from North Korean view, it also endured a large amount of air attacks during the Korean War of the entire North Korean territory. 630,000 tons of bombs, including 32,557 tons of napalm was shot on North Korea. That is three times more bombs that it got dropped in Japan. <clears throat> so since then, all the major military civilian facilities have been built underground below mountains in North Korea. So it is not easy to accept. I think North Korea should acknowledge now that North Korean regime will not be collapsed by economic sanctions because of the spirit of Charyok Gengzen, that is self-reliance and independence. As for security guarantee, North Korea views its nuclear weapons as a must for its survival, where its conventional weapons have been severely deteriorated due to economic sanctions. Some experts said that they eliminated dozens of nuclear weapons compared to hundreds, it's totally different matter. So now attack of the North Korean nuclear facility is not an option. So at this time, U.S. quickly should consider compromising approach of controlling dozens of current nuclear weapons before it's increasing hundreds of them. So negotiating ultimate dismantle of all the North Korean nuclear weapons in a peaceful way. So for the, North, for the US, US has the animosity toward North Korea. It's not easy to handle. 30,914 US soldiers died. And most of them remain still buried somewhere in the TMG because of two years of wars here. And two million landmines was buried in the area. We don't know how to safely unearth these soldiers' remains. I think it's about time U.S. overcome its animosity toward North Korea based on historical and cultural understanding of North Korea. I wish President Biden changed his view on Korean War based on its cultural understanding of North Koreans, foreign soldiers' views, and stretching ways to keep China and North Korea apart. So war memorial and peace park. Here. So Professor Wilson suggested Korean DMs can be a Gettysburg and 
U.S. and made it combined. I think President Biden should buy this wonderful idea. And the Biden, President Biden, should take the fallen soldiers during the Korean War and establishing the fifth UN Secretariat, <laughs> the first one in Asia. And fifth one is for religion, climate change, and nature protection. Biden can use DMG as a way of reducing carbon emissions. So I think I have to stop here because time is not allowed. So anyway, I very much hope that President Biden listens to the track two approach of turning Korean DMG into peace zone under UN jurisdiction and also US sort of a climate animosity toward North Korea based on more cultural and historical understanding of North Koreans who never invaded other countries for a thousand years while enduring over 900 times of foreign invasions as well as by Dr. Hak Chan Moon and Pastor Paula White. And thank you, thank you so much. Thank you. <clears throat> thank you, Dr. Lee, for that penetrating and uh, clear insight to Korean history uh, surrounding the Korean War. Um, the more we understand that, the more we can be empowered to, uh, to act uh, in, in, in a way that will bring about real solutions. So thank you so much for educating us today. Dr. Michael Jenkins, president of the Universal Peace Federation International has joined us and I'd like to invite him to just sh share a few comments. Dr. Jenkins. Thank you, thank you Hans. And thank you, Dr. Lee. I enjoy your presentation more each time I hear it. And today you added so much uh, up-to-date content and about the recent statements by uh, the White House uh, head of the Office of Faith and Opportunity, uh, Reverend Paula White uh, in the past administration, and also your hope that the DMZ peace zone really could be, could be realized. And I think we fully support that with UPF. So thank you so much, Dr. Lee, and we're very, very encouraged by your presentation. Uh, today, uh, we also have Mr. Julian Gray. Julian's lived in South Korea for 30 years and has worked in translation and publishing. He has taken a keen interest in the development of the unification movement as a platform of, for the communication of spiritual values. In 2019, he, brought, he published a, a very interesting work called The Faith That Broke the Iron Curtain which chronicled the struggle of the early family federation members in communist Czechoslovakia, including their arrest and imprisonment by their own government. He's observed and written about initiatives in relationship to North Korea, notably those, notably those carried out by Dr. Moon and also his wife, Dr. Hakchan Moon. And Dr. Hakchan Moon is continuing with Think Tank 2022 to assemble the world's experts to find ways to open up the dialogue and open up the way for peace on the Korean Peninsula and the, hopefully the peaceful reunification of Korea. Uh, Julian's study of these initiatives uh, are examples of what private citizens can accomplish and have accomplished. I'd like to welcome my dear friend, uh, Mr. Julian Gray. Welcome, Julian. Thank you very much for uh, inviting me to to be here today. Uh, I'm very honored. It was uh, very interesting to listen to Dr. Lee and, and learn actually many new things. I, I wish I could I get your PowerPoint, Dr. Lee, and, uh, and read it because uh, some parts were difficult to read. 
and the time was simply not enough, but uh, thank you so much. Uh, my presentation is uh, quite simple. Um, it's really to show, as Dr. Jenkins said, thank you for your kind introduction, Dr. Jenkins, uh, what's possible with initiative and with uh, perhaps one could say a, a staff or a personnel of willing and, uh, and creative uh, followers or disciples, uh, what is possible to be accomplished through the track to diplomacy uh, system. Um, I'll assume that uh, you in the audience uh, don't know so much about this, but of course, many of you will know quite a lot. And so, but I, even so, I hope you'll pick up something new and interesting uh, as we go along. Let me share my screen. That might be working. Uh, does that look all right? Looks yes. good. Okay. Well, the Korean War Armistice Agreement, of course, was not actually when Korea was first divided because the division happened after the end of the Second World War in 1945, but the uh, establ establishment of the demilitarized zone in 1953 certainly cemented that division. And, uh, but of course, it was not supposed to be, uh, and nobody thought at the time that this was going to be a, an almost permanent institution, which has now been in place for 65 or more years. Um, and everybody wonders how it can be uh, solved. Uh, the reality is that the, the situation has evolved so that um, North and South Korea really don't recognize each other. Uh, but assume that the other half of the peninsula is a renegade half of the peninsula that belongs to them. So they, both countries claim in a sense to be the sole legitimate government of Korea. That's the reason why South Korea will warmly welcome North Korean refugees. The Korean ref reunification would require that both sides would be willing to reunify, uh, but neither is so, will be willing so, so easily to give up control of the of the, uh, to give up control of the peninsula to the other. So this is really a vestige of the Cold War political divide. China also values North Korea as a buffer between itself and the westernized South Koreans. And it is really uncertain how China might respond to a unified Korea under the South. And uh, in fact, you know, some people think that China might even try to prevent the unification of Korea for that reason. But any move toward ending the war and unifying the Korea would involve the United States, which was a signatory to the armistice. And neither, would be, neither China nor the United States would be happy to lose their strategic position on the East Asian mainland. So it's an entangled political situation that requires multinational cooperation between nations, which have fundamental ideological differences and fundamental uh, differences of interests. So we look at, uh, we turn to civilian efforts uh, and what hope do they give us? Well, I'm going to talk about the work of uh, Father and Mother Moon, Father Sun Myung Moon and uh, Dr. Hak Jahan Moon, whose work uh, over the past 60 years uh, has focused quite a lot of effort on the situation in the Korean Peninsula and uh, what effects these events and efforts have had that they've not only done, uh, invested in themselves, but also uh, inspired many other people to work on. Well, those, uh, the evaluation will have to be done by history in the future. So let me, uh, maybe a little bit of background is needed uh, for those who are not so familiar. Sun Myung Moon was born in 1920 and felt called to go back to his native North Korea in 1946, uh, after Kim Il-sung had been installed already as the new communist leader. Uh, his future wife, whom he would marry in 1960, Hak Jahan, uh, grew up actually in a neighboring province in North Korea. Father Moon felt called to bring a deeper understanding of spiritual principles to, to the still quite Christian, but now under communist rule, 
uh, the people in Pyongyang. So that's why he went to North Korea. The long story short, he was arrested by the communist authorities and sent to a forced labor camp, which the regime used to systematically destroy its political enemies emotionally, mentally, and then physically with appalling cruelty. North Korea used the Chosun fertilizer plant. This is, was the largest industrial complex in Northeast Asia at the time, I believe. And one reason why it was targeted by the Americans for uh, by bombing uh, in August 1950 was because it was supplying uh, the, the fertilizer that was supplied to Russia from here was the barter for the arms that the Russians were supplying to North Korea for the build up for the Korean War. So Father Moon worked in this situation of being a slave laborer in this camp uh, where uh, people were worked, starved and uh, died of cold and malnutrition, many of them uh, within several months of going there. And uh, Carlton Sherwood, the American journalist who wrote about uh, uh, Father Moon uh, mentioned that uh, people who survive this kind of a systemized death camp situation are a very special group of people because they have to be able to uh, transcend feeling angry about their situation. They have to overcome any sense of self-pity. Sun Myung Moon survived by thinking not about how to satisfy his physical hunger or to keep warm or by resenting his situation, but in fact, he turned his mind and heart to his fellow prisoners and sought to relieve their suffering rather than his own. In so doing, he gained the power to transcend the physical deprivation which so many others were succumbing to. And he survived and went on to build a sizable movement that has dedicated, that he has dedicated to teaching such principles to many others, but also he has the ambition to inspire change on a much greater scale. So remarkably, some 40 years after he was a prisoner in this death camp, in this system, where he should really have died, he actually met Kim Il-sung, and Dr. Lee mentioned this, but his um, meeting with Dr. With, uh, Kim Il-sung was a, quite a remarkable event because uh, he had already been in North Korea a few days and had spoken in the North Korean parliament against the Juche ideology that is the governing ideology of North Korea. And when uh, Kim Il-sung was advised by his aides not to meet uh, Father Moon, Kim Il-sung was curious and really wanted to meet him because he felt, who is this man who comes to my country and publicly declares that my, uh, our founding ideology is no good. So I think he saw in Father a, a kindred spirit, a man of bravery and courage, and he felt he would like to meet him. And the meeting went very well, and you can read about it in uh, Father Moon's autobiography. An interesting little known fact, actually, which is probably pertinent to mention here at an IMAP, an IMAP seminar is that as with the previous year's meeting uh, in the Soviet Union with uh, Soviet President Mikhail Gorbachev, the meeting with Kim Il-sung was also made possible by a, a media connection, um, a, a back channel media connection, if you like, or uh, which allowed uh, the uh, South Korean contacts to communicate with the North and receive an invitation from the North and the OK for uh, Father and Mother Moon to go. The benevolent person has no enemy. This is uh, Mencius who lived something like 300 years before Christ. Uh, Father has, uh, and Mother Moon always mentioned that they went to North Korea with having cleared their hearts of any sense that Kim Il-sung was their enemy, despite the fact that of their personal past history, even Mother Moon had had to leave North Korea as a refugee at the age of five. The informal agree they actually made an informal agree agreement between, uh, between the North Korean uh, officials and uh, uh, Father Moon, uh, which uh, is quite interesting. But the agree agreement included discussion of the re reunion of families that had been separated by the division of the country. And uh, also included things to do with, um, included um, uh, economic collaboration and other kinds of exchange between the two halves of the peninsula. And, you know, quite soon afterwards, things began to happen. The reunion of families that were separated by the division of the peninsula uh, was an ongoing thing for a while, although our movement couldn't afford to 
sustain it ourselves in the end, and it was taken over by the Hyundai conglomerate. But at least it brought some families together. Here you can see a picture of North and South Korean family members who haven't seen each other for 40 or 50 years. So a lot of work was done over the years, and I'm going to go through this. I hope it doesn't seem just like a list, but um, the Summit Council, uh, Antonio Betancourt talks about this. He, uh, he was uh, very active in working as uh, Father Moon's representative, and he was able to go to North Korea uh, quite early on and meet with Kim Il-sung. In fact, I think he met with Kim Il-sung several times, but there, the, the Summit Council was a group of, uh, and still uh, these kinds of organizations exist, but uh, groups of um, former heads of state and government. Uh, and in fact, it was uh, a former Costa Rican president that helped Antonio get into North Korea the first time. Antonio later wrote, we met with the late Premier Kim Il-sung and other important officials with the support of the members of the Summit Council uh, and other prestigious citizens, uh, sorry, you know, with the support of the members of the Summit Council, we brought US dignitaries to North Korea and assisted Pyongyang in understanding the US and what they could do to improve relations with the United States. Summit Council efforts helped open the way for, Moon's, for the Moon's historic trip to North Korea in 1991. And then Antonio also mentioned when the famine began in North Korea in 1995, the Summit Council worked with the United Nations to help, <clears throat> uh, worked actually with various governments and uh, the Korea desk at the US State Department and with the United Nations and impressed upon some of the governments that it was important for them to consider assisting North Korea through the UN. So uh, when the UN launched its famine appeal for North Korea, the summit council members were in place in their countries to uh, persuade or try to persuade their countries to offer help. So a lot of humanitarian work came from this initiative and humanitarian work is always good track to diplomacy. The Women's Federation also has sent food to North Korea to help. This is for children. Um, they have a 1% sharing, a love sharing project, which continues to gather funds and food and send to the North, which of course is, uh, you know, really very helpful as long as it's used in a good way. Um, Mrs. Moon Lan Yong, who herself is from North Korea, she's second from the left here in the blue attire, uh, led the Women's Federation for many years and uh, took uh, her right-hand people to North Korea to meet the, uh, her counterparts, the leaders of Women's Federation, uh, of, of women's organizations in North Korea and built quite close relationships and even took a large delegation of uh, Women's Federation uh, international delegates and leaders from around the world to North Korea where they met again with uh, the North Korean women. You can see Mrs. Moon a second from the right here and the lady nearest to us is the North Korean women's lady, women's uh, organization representative. And they met many times. So of course, it's hard to know. Uh, unfortunately, the South Korean government, not only the North Korean government, but the South Korean government put a lid on just how easily organizations could meet and do their work, especially NGOs like the Women's Federation in North Korea. And so it became more difficult actually to hold these kinds of meetings, but still the effort uh, obviously is good because then you bring people together and you get, uh, and ideas are shared and hearts are shared. Cultural exchange, um, I would like to mention in 1993, one of the first initiatives that happened after the visit of uh, the moons to North Korea was a couple of seminars which took place in Beijing where they got students together from uh, China, the United States, Japan, North Korea, and South Korea. And in this meeting, there were something like 150 students. And of course, the main uh, thrust or the main uh, benefit of the meeting was that North and South Korean professors and students could meet directly and talk together. Dr. Robert Kittle was there among the American delegation, and he said, the closing banquet was an unbelievably intense emotional experience for both the North and South Koreans. Arm in arm, they stood on the stage singing slightly different variations of their national song, Tongyeol, which is unity. But there was not a dry eye among them. When the singing stopped, small groups of North and South Koreans intensely embraced each other, wiping each other's tears. 
Several of the students were sobbing uncontrollably. Yes, the North Korean students cried. They are human just like everyone else. Um, I never understood why these seminars and meetings could not have continued. They were an amazing initiative. And uh, I suppose it's because governments get nervous about when people get too close. My brief personal story is that I was in North Korea once in the Kumgang, Mount, Kumgang, Kumgang mountain area and had a chance to talk with the North Korean guards who uh, made sure that we didn't escape into the, into the hills from our tourist group. And, um, you know, at first they asked me questions about why do I think that North Korea is part of the axis of evil or questions about the uh, US and British allied invasion of Baghdad and things like that, trying to perhaps see if they could catch me off guard. Uh, but in, in the end, they came down to talking about things like how to learn English well and, and, and were interested to know that my children had been born in Korea and that their language was also my children's first language. So I felt these people are really human beings and you know, there's really not uh, a great deal of difference. And so we should be able to unite the two Koreas. Cultural exchange, also a very interesting uh, thing that uh, Father and Mother Moon sent the Little Angels, which they'd founded in 1962 to Pyongyang to perform in Pyongyang. And of course, there they met their counterparts, the North Korean Children's Performing Arts Troupe. And you can see that they made good relationships. And uh, this, of course, would have been good in itself. But uh, not two years after that, the North Korean Performing Arts Troupe came to the South. And this is the Little Angels Performing Arts Center where the North Koreans are performing. And they made a very close relationship uh, with the audience. This is a North Korean little girl dancing with a South Korean gentleman. And I can tell you, I was here. Um, the atmosphere in the hall was completely open and happy and joyful as if the reunification of Korea had happened right there in that hall. And I thought, what an incredible initiative this is. Dashi Manapshida, let's meet again, the sign says at the finale. And of course, that's what they would have wanted to do. But these girls who have now known each other for two years and met twice and spent several days together each time now have to say goodbye. And the North Korean uh, performing arts children's troupe has to go back to North Korea and they are all in tears. And it, it always brings me to tears to think <laughs> about this and to see these photographs. Not long after this happened, there was a, a television program and one of the little angels was interviewed and she was asked, um, what about the reunification of North and South Korea? And she said, well, the children have already created unity between North and South. We're waiting for the adults. Sometimes I think that in international affairs, perhaps children are more grown up than we are. Business relationships. The Pyongyang Motors uh, venture was an amazing adventure. It, it's now back in North Korean hands, but it was a joint venture between uh, a North Korean company, Ryongbyong, and, and, and our uh, family federation, then known as the Unification Church, but it was a joint venture, but it was set up, interestingly, not in a free economic zone, it was set up under North Korean business law by this gentleman, uh, Park Sang-won, who is actually really a remarkable diplomat in his own right. He, um, he said, uh, Sun Myung Moon's meeting with President Kim Il Sung had a huge effect and a good influence on us. That's one reason North, North Korea is supporting this venture. Having a car factory is not just for business, but we are leading the way for the reunification of North and South Korea and for world peace. This is his way of looking at it. We are giving pride to North Koreans who can now say, oh yes, we can make cars too. Many people ask how I work in North Korea. Many companies lost ground, making mistakes. They asked me, how is it that you are still there? You can even make money. It's true. In 2009, I believe, I think the company made a profit of $750,000, which of which $500,000 was sent to Seoul for, you know, to the company headquarters in Seoul because it was a legitimately earned profit. Park Sang-won said, it's very simple. My strategy is I really love them. I deal with them honestly. 
In the beginning, you can lie, but a month later, a year later, or 18 years later, it will be discovered and they will think badly of you. But for 18 years, I've been here and I've told them, I've never told them untruths. I love the North Koreans, reconciliation through meeting together. Forgiveness can be done remotely, but to reconcile a breakdown, you need to meet. Pyonghua Motors allows that process to continue. He's been to North Korea hundreds of times. His work is amazing. Sports diplomacy. This is Father Moon opening the Peace Cup in Madrid in 2009, looking very dapper at the age of 89, I might say. Um, Father Moon created a soccer team in Brazil called Soracaba. And it, this isn't really very well known perhaps by everybody, but it also, this team was brought to North Korea and actually went to North Korea and played a, a friendly match against the North Korean side. And Kim Hung Tae, who on the left here in this picture, uh, met with the North Korean Soccer Association uh, staff, and this is one of their representatives on the right, and they exchanged uh, cards and also made arrangements uh, to, to play these games. And in the end, uh, the North Korean women's soccer team went to Brazil and lived and trained at the Sorocaba training camp in Brazil at our movement's expense. Uh, I think they paid their airfares to get there, but um, they were training for the German Women's World Cup in 2011 to acclimatize to the weather and so forth. So uh, I think Father Moon's hope with this soccer diplomacy was that it would enable, uh, as with all the other uh, I, uh, ways of looking into, uh, of getting into North Korea, this would allow um, uh, ways to reach the North Korean leadership. I think Father Moon's view was if you could reach the North Korean leadership, the leading class, you could influence them and you could uh, show them that you love them and that, and that your heart uh, is for the best for them. And I think that's the, the value of all track to diplomacy. There's uh, initiatives today, I have to go very quickly because I think we're very near the end of the time, but Think Tank 22 is the initiative that, that uh, Mother Moon has really been championing, championing, bringing together heads of state and government and top leaders to discuss the issues on the Korean Peninsula. We had uh, uh, former Secretary of State Mike Pompeo, the US Secretary of State. Uh, we had uh, former US Vice President Mike Pence, and here he is speaking with a North Korean refugee us answering a question. Um, this exchange were good. These two, of course, being from the, uh, the Trump administration, they uh, made very clear their view that any negotiation with North Korea would have to be on the, would have to be to uh, clarify to them that the alliance between the United States, Japan and South Korea was rock solid and wasn't going to budge. And that on that basis, then negotiations could be productive. And I think that's a, that was a very solid stance. Um, but of course, it's not necessarily reconciliatory from the North Korean point of view. On the other hand, in the third uh, <laughs> Think Tank 2022 forum, we had Jim Rogers, the famous uh, international investor. And his view is that what you can do when you remove the DMZ uh, is that you can have the free flow of uh, funds and people. And uh, what's more, if you build a tunnel between Korea and Japan, you can create a, an economic boom in Northeast Asia and beyond. So of course his views are, are somewhat different, but at the same time, he looks at the DMZ as an impediment to the development and, uh, of, of the economy and therefore of uh, people's living standards. Um, I'm not sure what he thinks about the idea of building a peace zone in the DMZ, but certainly that question was raised during the, uh, the uh, Think Tank 2022 forum that he was the feature that he was featured in. The Korea-Japan tunnel was also favorably assessed by an international tunnel expert. Now, this was the journalist who asked about making the DMZ into a peace zone. So that this uh, I appreciate Dr. Lee very much with uh, his presentation. But this, the idea of using the DMZ as a way to bring uh, a rapprochement, to bring North and South Korea together is a wonderful idea. And if it can be used for that, then I think it's great. I think it's important that the DMZ doesn't get institutionalized for its own sake, because it is actually a dividing point between the two halves of Korea. But if it can be used as a way to bring them together, and I think Dr. Lee is championing this with his work, and I, I very much appreciate what he's doing. Um, I think that would be wonderful. 
So there's also reconciliation through the rallies of hope that have been going on. And you know, not only with, for example, American war veterans like Charles Rangel, who's in the US congressman, but also uh, people like Captain Arsenkin, who was a Russian boat captain during the Korean War. And he paid tribute to Father and Mother Moon for their efforts to try and bring reconciliation, to try and bring uh, things to a conclusion. So on both sides, because Russia is part of, uh, under UPF is part of the European region. So in the European UPF sphere, they're holding many conferences and webinars like this, which involve people who were from from Russia, which of course was on the other side of the Korean War. So there's great hope for reconciliation. And I think that uh, Father and Mother Moon, everything they've done has been for the, uh, in relation to North Korea, has been for the uh, initiative of peace and their work is to be commended. I hope that history will look back kindly on their efforts because it's not been an easy path for them, but we are so grateful uh, to have been able to watch and observe and be part of these initiatives. And we hope that we can continue to do so. I'll end my presentation there. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Julian. What a wonderful presentation. And so, so much uh, has been done and so such diverse activities to bring peace from culture and arts to sports, to dialogue, to business. And now the Think Tank 2022 is developing very rapidly. And uh, every Tuesday, we hold this seminar here uh, in North America. And we have participants from around the world, but every Tuesday we're here. Uh, next Tuesday, we have the former US ambassador to Korea, Ambassador Harry Harris, who also was the uh, Supreme Commander of PACOM, which was the all uh, US forces combined for the Pacific Fleet and Indochina. Uh, and so we really, uh, really Indo-Pacific, we really believe that peace is coming. We can see it, but it's also very difficult. So Dr. Lee is a professor of NYU and uh, also a uh, real uh, director of the DMZ Forum. Uh, you had very good advice for President Biden. Uh, just in briefly, where do we stand right now in terms of your many years of experience. Are we going the right direction or are we just stuck or are we going backwards? Uh, I think uh, the Biden administration seems to be too cautious uh, in moving toward the, uh, to what, what President Trump, Trump had, had left in the year 2018, I think Biden should be more proactive in engaging, engaging North Korea. So I think the, as I suggested in the presentation, Korean DMG seems to be the right place the President Biden can work on to get some, um, some release of the northern part of DMG from President Kim Jong-un for a peace zone is a very good idea to start the negotiation in exchange for limited lifting of economic sanctions. Because otherwise, North Korea will not try to listen to anything from the United States. And then also, President Biden should listen to Unification Church's movement what has, has been done to North Korea. Because Kim Il-sung, Kim Jong-il, and Kim Jong-un shared all the same experience with uh, Reverend Moon and Dr. Hak Cha Han Moon's contributions to their country, especially peace motors, and all other activities. So I, I very much hope that Biden administration should be more proactive in dealing with North Korea and try to think about to keep China and North Korea apart because North Korea is very much willing to get friends with the United States for its own cultural kind of stance. Mm -hmm. So I think 
President Biden should work more proactively with North Korea, DMZ, and the Unification Church Movement in the year 2022. Thank, Thank you. you, Dr. Lee. Uh, Julian, uh, what are your views on the impact of Think Tank 2022? You've been in Korea during those forums, and I've been on the U.S. side where we've been hosting some of the forums for the U.S. Uh, leadership, like Speaker Newt Gingrich and Ambassador Hill, uh, former ambassador to Korea, and many others. And they were very delighted with the engagement with the members of the National Assembly with the former Minister of Unification, Kim Young Chul, yes. and many others. And uh, yeah. also with the defectors. It was very, very encouraging mm -hmm. for Vice President Pence. Uh, what's your feeling about the impact of Think Tank 2022? Well, I think I could just say simply that I, I do hope the South Korean government is paying attention uh, and seeing that you know there are these extraordinary shall we say, track two efforts, because of course, uh, Mike Pompeo and uh, Mike Pence, they're, they're no longer members of the US government. So it's really track two diplomacy. Um, and I think that it, it shows the level at which it can be uh, got to. And I think that it's very, as you say, you know, we, we have a high level former Korean politicians and high level former American politicians discussing these issues publicly and uh, people like uh, Ambassador Christopher Hill weighing in. So we, you know, an extraordinary level of committed people who have great expertise, uh, Ambassador Dutrani as well, incredible uh, to get these people. And I hope the, the, uh, that it will influence the, ho hopefully the South Korean government will feel a sense of that, that there's some motion that, that they should pick up on this and that they should be connected. And also it's, it's of course, it's very nice to see something like a uh, former Vice President Pence answering a question from a North Korean defector who's arrived safely in South Korea. These things are very uh, theatrical, but in a sense, they're also very touching. And like any, like uh, many of the things that we've seen, uh, I believe that uh, this is a very good initiative. Um, it's an interesting platform because of course, not all the people who came to it, we had Paula White's uh, Interfaith uh, Think Tank 2022 Forum as well, which was a, also another perspective, a faith-based perspective perspective of the uh, uh, of approaching the, the issue of North and South Korea. And of course, investor Jim Rogers, his perspective was completely different. So in a sense, the fact also that we are hosting a forum where these different views can be shared and where people can be uh, inspired to contribute and to think about these things is itself of immense value, I think. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. That's what I'll, that's what I can say. Uh, the Biden administration is very much cooperating with our efforts and people don't know the details, but also mm -hmm. the Obama administration did a lot with us too. We did uh, about nine uh, fact finders with the Washington Times and we were able to meet both the uh, Mrs. Park's uh, administration and then President Moon's administration. And, and uh, we had many meetings in Washington as well as uh, very top level people. And because of the people who are working with us, like Ambassador Hill and also Ambassador Detrani, uh, we got the attention from every administration, from the foreign ministry to the NIS, and deep dialogue and deep friendships formed. And I think that's one thing that is very encouraging. Even the Democrats and Republicans are very united about Northeast Asia. Uh, and that's that's a good that's good news. Uh, uh, the Biden administration has not backed away from President Trump's policies in Northeast Asia, We're, and he's strengthening the Quad too to to bring balance, not to have dominance, but to bring balance. And uh, there has to be that balance. Also, we cannot avoid the discussion about uh, our neighbor to the north is China. China is very much a key player for the reunification of Korea. And we are seeking that cooperation. I really like what you brought up about Mr. Uh, Park sang uh, that being honest. And that's what I've learned from, uh, you know, Ambassador Detrani's experience. He still meets uh, regularly representatives of North Korea and New York uh, at the embassy and also the uh, Chinese too. And because they were all involved with the six party talks they became friends. They became friends in 1994, for, or I'm sorry, 2004, 2005. And those people all now have senior positions in all the government. 
Japan, Korea, China. And uh, this human factor is very important. That's what Secretary Pompeo really emphasized. And uh, one of the people who always hosted us in South Korea uh, is now the uh, director of intelligence uh, for the United States on North Korea. He's the senior official. And we have very good relationships. So that's why engagement is so important. It's, these seminars are so important. Uh, we're not taking sides here. We're trying to solve the problem. But at the same time, we have to really see, uh, I think what Dr. Lee is bringing to the table too, is this reforestation of North Korea, the flooding, the disease, or so much. And I, we have one of our wonderful participants, uh, Dr. Emma Heron uh, asked, uh, with the ongoing pandemic, we should consider even more how to involve healthcare professionals. I, we couldn't agree more, Emma. Uh, thank you for that. And we want to engage more health officials. And we're trying, we're seeking to, to you know, get beyond this era of division, I mean, where the borders are closed. Right now, the North Korean borders are closed. There are still some people that have waivers there that are doing humanitarian work. I think humanitarian work is extremely important, but Dr. Lee, the reforestation that you've, you've been behind, uh, how was that received in North Korea? Because it stops the flooding. When you, when you uh, build the forests again and grow the forests again, like they did in South Korea, after the Korean War, the, the hills were barren. The mountains were just devastated, but they grew back through human uh, stewardship and management. So how do you see North Korea receiving that kind of effort? Yeah, I think the President Kim Jong-un pretty much emphasized the reforestation of North Korea, entire North Korea. It's number one policy of North Korea. But because of this pandemic, our work in the North Korea has been stopped uh, several years ago. So we, the DMZ Forum and uh, New Jersey-based organization called One World Peace Association is initially working together to uh, plant trees in Jongju and Anju in North Korea, where the, the Father Moon and Mother Moon's birthplace. So that's, yeah. we are working together. So as soon as this pandemic situation subsides and somehow the dialogue between the US and the uh, Unification Church in North Korea resumes, then we can start the reforestation in North Korea. That's very much needed at this time. Thank you very much. Julian, what, what are your hopes for a breakthrough with North and South Korea coming together? Right now, there's, they reopened the line of communication, the hotline. Um, what, are your, what are you hearing from experts in South Korea? <laughs> are we moving forward, or are we stuck, or are we going backwards? Well, I, I don't think I should try to be too clever with my answer here. I'm not really in touch with the right people to give you an answer based on communication with top level people. But I mean, I think the human factor, as you mentioned, is, is so important. And we've seen it in the track two, track two diplomacy in various areas so powerfully. And uh, Father Moon and Mother Moon, when they went to North Korea uh, and even other members of their family that went there, they made these very close relationships. In fact, the uh, uh, Kim Jong-un still sends cards to Mother Moon for uh, her birthday. And, uh, you know, they were, as you know, I don't think there's a lot of close communication, but um, I think having seen the situation in Germany, although it's not comparable really, but I have very much hope that the North and South Korea, when the somehow the conditions that hold them apart somehow evaporate, and maybe it's some kind of a spiritual thing as well, then I think, you know, they could come together much more quickly than most people suppose. Most people say that it's not going to be like that and we have to dig in for 20, 30, 40 years more. But I actually believe that uh, there are other forces at work than just, you know, the geopolitical, the socio-political forces that, we, that we're used to. And that I think that, you know, something could go. Uh, Kim Jong-un, for example, may wish to give it up and say to 
uh, you know, the alliance to the US and South Korea and Japan, look, I, I can't do this anymore. I'm just fed up with hurting my people and uh, I, I'd like your help. And then maybe uh, the US, Japan, South Korea, China could go to North Korea and say, okay, we'll make you a deal. We'll, we'll invest $50 billion in your country over the next five years. You agree to let your political prisoners go. You stay in power, Kim Jong-un. Uh, the nuclear arms are put on a moratorium, no development. Uh, you know, we, we give you this chance. And if you take it, then, you know, your country can be an advanced country in a generation. And I, I don't see why, you know, that's a little bit like the Jim Rogers approach. But I mean, I think, you know, there, there, there's the possibility always of that kind of a breakthrough. And I, I'll leave it at that. Thank you. Well, thank you. Thank you. I think Julian and, and Dr. Lee, we've had a wonderful session here. Uh, I think the more we listen to these programs and get involved with uh, trying to help out, there is always hope. Uh, we do have to be well aware, though, that there are other forces at work where the advancement of nuclear weapons is actually continuing on, unabated and unhindered. And uh, that is definitely the issue for the United States, uh, all the experts, whether they're Democrat or Republican, uh, there's, there's, it's not only that North Korea would have its own nuclear weapons and ICBM delivery systems, but it's what would happen in the region. That's why China doesn't want North Korea to get deliverable nuclear weapons. There, that's, that's a very important common ground we share with China because they know if that really goes to full fruition, then uh, there'll be proliferation of nuclear arms and it won't be able to be stopped. No one can stop it. So the other surrounding countries will get armed with nuclear weapons. And there's a great concern that, you know, without dialogue, without understanding, without communication, uh, you can have some mistake occur where things go hot suddenly. And uh, that's why I think that these wonderful uh, people on all sides are that are trying to come together and have that communication is so important. It is very important that we open the way of dialogue with North and South Korea and the United States and the six parties too. All are going to have to be considered. That's that's one of the things that Think Tank 2022 sees as crucial. And I think you're both adding a lot of uh, a lot of positive hope and support for that. And, uh, you know, the relationship of Kim Jong-un towards father and mother moon goes back to the breakthrough they had with uh, Kim Il-sung, which you mentioned before, but that was a phenomenal, phenomenal breakthrough. Nobody could imagine that kind of thing, um, but it did happen. And it was person to person. That's one thing Secretary Pompeo shared of what he felt actually caused things to move forward was there was not just an idea of having all the diplomats get together and try to negotiate our way to have a, you know compromise and then uh, more safety. Uh, actually, the president of the last administration went right in there and wanted to meet the, the, the chairman. And uh, that opened up doors. That's why stepping across the uh, uh, the 38th parallel, parallel at Pen Munjan is really quite a phenomenal moment in history. And uh, that's what I'm finding people in Asia really see. It wasn't a simple thing. And we're saddened that it didn't go forward even further. Uh, I think it was set to go forward, but there's also, you know, some things that have to be adjusted. And that's what we're working on now. Uh, that's why there is... Uh, UPF, which sponsors this program, I'm president of UPF, Dr. Walsh is our chairman, but we have many, many member countries of UPF that have direct diplomatic relationships with North Korea. It's an interesting thing. It's a phenomenon. So we have delegations that come to Mother Moon's conferences, like the World Summit, that also will be able to go right to North Korea whenever they set up the proper uh, planning. Right now, it's difficult, though, because of COVID, but but that's, a, that's something that really gives a very different kind of uh, relationship. And I think what you brought up, uh, Julian and Dr. Lee, we want to go forward. We are, they are part of our family. The North Korean people are part of the family of, of mankind. 
And uh, once they get in the right circumstances, they'll flourish. And that's what Jim Rogers was bringing up. If we allow the education and economic development to go forward, this could become a, an economic miracle, like, you know, the miracle on the Han could become uh, the miracle of North and South together, combined with Japan. So I want to thank you both. We're really uh, happy. Hans, what a great program today to have this kind of, uh, you know, in-depth presentation and opportunities. So Hans, go ahead. Next yes, thank, week, by the thank way, you. we'll be here with the Ambassador yeah. Harris. With thank, the thank you, Dr. Jenkins. <clears throat> thank you. Thank you for curating our Q&A today. I just want to uh, thank Dr. Sang Ho Lee and uh, Mr. Julian Gray. I was watching the numbers, Julian, and it, they just kept climbing, you know, as far as participants. And I'd like to just show our participants um, our website here by sharing, uh, sharing my website. Uh, but here, you know, IMAP is one of a number of different associations that our founder, uh, Mother Moon, has initiated as of the, the World Summit in 2020. And uh, as you can see, there's, there's seven, seven different organizations. And this is just the North American chapter. We have a chapter, through, we have chapters throughout the world on each continent. So multiply these seven times five, that's 35 organizations that are working and that you can be a part of. I'm sure there's a, there's a, a donation button here somewhere. And also you can get a newsletter and you can be, become a, a participant, become a track to activists and ambassador of peace as we call them. Great. Great. So please come and visit our, our website. It's us.upf.org and you can join the party and um, get, get, this, uh, get this, uh, uh, this, this task done that, that we've been talking about today. So thank you again for participating. God bless you, have a wonderful new year and we'll see you next month. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Julia. <laughs> <clears throat> okay.